Okay, so picking up with language, we just left off talking about extreme language diversity in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is just to give you a better sense of that. This is just looking at Nigeria alone, where more than 400 different languages are spoken. So you can really get a sense of the language diversity in this part of the world. So this is something that will need to be considered, for example, when you're working on your projects. If you're going to do anything that involves uh, dissemination of material, how are you going to handle that? If you're going to give out brochures, for instance, are you going to translate them into 400 different languages? Or are you going to focus on uh, lingua francas for the region, or official languages, or not use a language at all and focus on something that uses primarily pictures? So every topic that we talk about is going to relate to your project in some way. Then we can also look at tonal or character based language. Uh, now these are languages where a tonal language is a language where the tone actually can create meaning or change the meaning of a word. So English for example will not be considered a tonal language. You can say the word uh, computer, for instance, and it doesn't matter what tone you use to say it. So you can say computer, 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 computer. You know, I used you know four or five different tones there. It still means computer. In a tonal language, if you change the tone that you use, you completely change the meaning of the word. It's a completely different word. And an example of a tonal language is Chinese. Uh, Mandarin has several different tones, uh, five different tones. Um, Cantonese has even uh, a larger number of tones. So you could say the same word, uh, like ma, for instance, and depending how you say it, if your voice goes up at the end, if your voice goes down at the end, if your voice goes down and then up, You've, you've changed the meaning of the word dramatically uh, from mother to horse. So you really need to be aware of the subtleties of the differences in tone with tonal languages, and that's why they can be so difficult uh, to learn. You also have languages that are character-based languages, and Chinese is another example of that. And these are languages where a character or a symbol is used instead of actual letters. So sometimes they're also called pictograms because they might resemble a picture or resemble the actual idea that you're trying to get across. And again, there are several different tonal languages, several different character-based languages, but I'm just using Chinese as an example. Uh, but Chinese has over you know, 30,000 different characters. So an example, of that is if I were to write, um, you know, I I heart something or I heart you. So I would write uh, I and then I would make the uh, draw a heart and then put uh, write out the word you. Uh, you know what that means, although the heart is just a heart. Okay, now I didn't actually uh, spell out L O V E. You know, I love you but you know that symbol of the heart means love. So that is a crude analogy, but it's an analogy of what a character-based language is, and characters build off of characters. So if I wanted to use that analogy, I could put several hearts together to mean I uh, love you a lot. Okay, so for example, the character for a tree uh, resembles a tree. The character for a forest is uh, three of those characters for tree put together. So characters build off of other characters. Uh, so that's the idea of a tonal or character based language. Again, like I said, there are many of them, there are dozens of them uh, around the globe, but Chinese is probably the one that they're most uh, familiar with. Now, another thing I want to talk about regarding language is a toponym. And a toponym is just another name for a place name. And place names are really important. When we talked about place at the beginning of the semester, when we're talking about the five themes of geography, 
Um, we talked about how uh, we want to create a sense of place. Well, one way to create a sense of place is in the name. So the name does impart a certain character on a place. It gives it a certain type of characteristic. It can also reflect uh, social processes in a place. It can also tell us a little bit about the history of a place. So place names are extremely important, whether it is the name of a country, the name of a capital or a city, the name of a town, uh, the name of a building, uh, the name of a business. They all evoke a certain type of feeling. If you look at a fancy shopping center, for instance, it, it usually isn't called, you know, shopping center number one. It usually has some sort of uh, French or Italian name or, or something to evoke importance or sophistication or elegance. Uh, so we, we see this in the names of not only shopping centers, but housing developments, building complexes, uh, all of those sorts of things. Um, this was talked about a little bit in the video you saw earlier on uh, social class. So the place name really does make a big difference. And there are uh, many different types of place names, but there are four primary place names. And that's descriptive, incident, manufactured, and possessive. A descriptive place name literally describes the place. So it, it does just that. It literally describes the place. So for example, uh, the Grand Canyon is a Grand Canyon. So that's an example of a descriptive name. So the Rocky Mountains are Rocky Mountains. So when I said literal, I mean literal. They literally describe the place. Incident names have something to do with something that happened there. <clears throat> so was there an event there? Was there uh, a battle there? Was there a fire there? So there are several uh, towns and cities that are named after specific events that happened there. Uh, manufactured names are just made up. So sometimes we try to uh, attribute some grand meaning to things uh, when in reality it was just a name that somebody thought sounded nice. So there isn't really a history behind it. There's no specific reason for it. It is it's simply just a name uh, that was made up. Um, an example of this would be uh, you know, Zizix okay, in California. That, that's a classic example of a manufactured name. Uh, and a possessive name is one that is named after somebody. Okay, so there are lots of those. So Carson City. I mean, any any name or town that was named after a person is considered uh, a possessive place name. And many times <clears throat> we find the situation where uh, toponyms or place names are changed. Because when you change the name of a place, you really have the power to create a new history. It's almost as though you're wiping the slate clean and starting over. Because that place name, as I mentioned, uh, has a lot of power. So I listed some major reasons why names of places are changed. Uh, one is after decolonization. So many times after a country uh, becomes a sovereign nation or becomes independent, one of the first things they do is change the place name because they want to erase that colonial past. And they may change it back to a name that that region held before colonialism, or they may pick an entirely new name, but they want to start anew and wipe away that colonial past. Could be after a political revolution. We see that happening uh, oftentimes, particularly if it's a change from a uh, dictatorship. They may want to remove all reminders of that particular person. Um, or it could go the other way around as well. If, when we look at uh, Myanmar, for example, that, that uh, used to be Burma, uh, changed to a military dictatorship and now is technically Myanmar. However, many people that live in that region, as well as in the international community, 
uh, do not necessarily agree with that particular uh, regime and still refer to that area as Burma, although uh, that is not technically the official name, but it may be again at a point in the future. Uh, could be to memorialize people or to memorialize uh, events. So you name a place after a particular person. Uh, or it could be to commodify and brand a place. Again, we talked about commodification a lot um, at the beginning of the semester. But I put two examples here. Uh, the two examples here are not necessarily commodification. Uh, these are just examples of places that change names. So we have Ceylon to Sri Lanka, East Pakistan to Bangladesh, uh, but the list is endless. The list goes on and on and on. And this is why when, uh, I, when you look up your locations for your exams, be sure that you have a source that is not more than five or ten years old because it is common for name changes uh, to occur, particularly uh, cities. So please make sure you have a source that is uh, up to date because many times I'll get answers uh, for countries, particularly in Africa, where they no longer exist and it will be marked uh, incorrect. So for example, if you have to um, identify the Democratic Republic of the Congo and you put Zaire, which was its former name, uh, that would be incorrect. So please be sure you have um, up-to-date maps when you're studying for your map locations. So this concludes the section on language.